throughout centuries, we learned that Christians are being persecuted because of their faith. We used to think that was something in the past, but in 21st century, we get to hear the similar stories happens to our brothers and sisters. Around the world, our brothers and sisters are being persecuted. They've been killed, they've been kidnapped, they've been forced into conversion, and they've been tortured in some occasions, they've been imprisoned. And sadly, on 7th April, 2022, we, woke up with very sad news that Father Arsenios in Egypt is being killed by the followers of religion of Islam. This ideology is so peaceful, it simply kills people who do not worship Allah and Muhammad. Today, we have the privilege of um, having Brother Peter with us. Brother Peter is actually... <laughs> a uh, brother of Father Arcelanus. And uh, we just thought we take this time together and then talk to her about Father Arcelanus as well as life of Christians in Egypt. Uh, peace and grace of Lord Jesus Christ be with you, brother. How are you doing? We're trying to get through this. It's a difficult time, but with the grace of the Lord and the prayer of so many and the hope that we have in our Lord Christ, Jesus Christ, that we know that we have hope to see him again one day in heaven with our Savior, and our Redeemer, our Lord Jesus Christ. While you are going through this grieving process, um, I just want to express once again, I'm so grateful that you are able to talk to us and help us to get to know a little bit about your brother as well as how do you deal with uh, with such a grievement um, as a Christian. So um, can you just tell me um, who you are a little bit and then we talk about Father Arsenios. Well, I'm Peter, uh, the twin brother of Father Arsenius. We grew up together and uh, I left to, for the United States when I was probably 26, but we always kept in touch and he used to come and visit with us and we go visit and uh, just uh, we cannot we are inseparable yeah in, in in far long distance so you are his twin's brother um yes i am wow. his twin brother and the, the saddest thing that he was supposed to be here with us today in the, in the united states for a visit yes yeah yes. so therefore i guess you must find this time much much more difficult yeah, than have it that is hard. I'm so sorry about that. But as you expressed, the promise Lord Jesus Christ gives us, uh, yes. gives us hope that we, one day we will see uh, our brothers and sisters um, in the bosom of the Father when we go home. Yes, um, absolutely. I understood that your brother was um, 56 years old when he died. Actually, yeah. And the address, uh, the, the the age that it was put on the on the, on the media, it was wrong. Oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Actually, yeah, yeah, seriously. Yeah. He's actually we are actually turned sixty this year. Oh, we were born I, in sixty-one. Yeah. If I if I were you, I wouldn't mention that because they put your age a little bit younger. That's always good. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad I'm four years younger. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah, um, it is. Yeah, we we're, we're sixty years old. Uh, so, uh, beloved of Christ, uh, your brother was a priest um, in in the Orthodox Church. Uh, would you be kind of tell us a little bit about um, your brother? Um, how was your childhood together? As well as how did he end up being priest? Yes. Well, first of all, Egypt has approximately fifteen to twenty percent Christian. So there's a lot of families there that they are Christian. We were uh, we grew up in a Christian family. My mm -hmm. mom, my mother specifically, she was very very bold, powerful believer in Christ, and she used to also kind of surprisingly at that time ministering to our Muslim neighbors secretly, of course, you know nobody knows. But they used to come up to her with questions, and she was bold to answer. She's, she was amazing evangelist in, in her days, actually, you know, because unfortunately, 
I didn't want to get into this, but in general, the, there's not much evangelism in Egypt from, from the, let's say, from Christian to Muslim. It's more like they accepted the deal a long time ago. You have your religion, we have our religion. So you don't mix, you don't evangelize. And of course, because of the price. <laughs> price of evangelism in Egypt, it's, it's very hard. So Egypt, like I said, have a big number of Christians, and we grow up in a Christian family. And uh, when we were in around high school age, you know, 15, 16, just got put the desire in our hearts to serve, to serve Sunday school and the children. So we were involved in the Sunday school ministry. Although not in the same place, but uh, we were involved to the point, like uh, you know, my my father, my brother was involved in the place that he was ministering the children from age four or five, the same children all the way until they finished their their high school and college education, the same children. So he was discipling from when they were very little, and. Uh, he was also ministering to the youth and he was always involved in the church in so many ways. And we have a lot of places out there for retreats that are outside the, the cities. We're actually from Alexandria, so they're outside the city, basically in the middle of the desert, there are monasteries. And in those monasteries, there's a lot of uh, time that we used to go there and have a retreat in the summer or a week or two weeks. And, you know, we come back kind of refreshed with the, with the spirit and we were just always involved with the church and the ministry. And he was so dedicated to disciple people all the time. And in 1996, I think he was ordained as a, as a Coptic priest and one of the biggest church in Alexandria in number. The church is not huge, but because the number of churches in Egypt are very limited. There is no permit for new ones at that time. So there'll be a small church, have a congregation of 10,000, 20,000. So his church was one of those. But he was ordained on the church in the hope that in the future to open a church or to, to, to establish a church in another neighborhood, which is not far from the original church, but there's a lot of Christian there that they come to the church. So it would be his, the goal to establish another church for them in their neighborhood. So in uh, around the 2003, they bought a piece of land over there in that neighborhood. That neighborhood also is a very dangerous, it's full of fanatics, you know, Muslim Brotherhood and Salafis, they're, they're all over and also full of drug dealers and drug addicts it's just it's, it's a bad neighborhood in general but there's a lot of christian living in that neighborhood so when he bought that land and they started can uh, you know how it is you cannot get a permit that easy so in, in the hope that you know maybe you can build the building or halfway and then when the permit comes you can establish the church so just he started to put the fence around the property and then a big crowd of Muslim Brotherhood they came with swords and knives and machetes and, and all kind of weapons and pretty much they put the sword on his neck and they said there would be no church built here and I think a week or two weeks later they there was a guy there who was guarding that, that piece of land they took him and they threw him from eight story high building to his death and of course, it was considered suicide. So that land was gone. So eventually, and like many years later, he took another piece of land in the same area. And they started to say, well, we can start building something that looks like a factory. And we can worship in it and, you know, secretly until we get the permit for the church. And then we can finish the building. So, you know, different idea. They built it and they started to worship in it also an odd time and secret. And, but eventually the Muslim Brotherhood found about, found, found, found about the place. So they came out with a lot of people with swords and knives and all the stuff and they just and destroyed my brother's car. 
and other cars with it from the from the people that they were worshiping with him. And uh, very much the place eventually turned into like an apartment building or something like that. And then in around 2015 or 16, he bought another piece of land. See, he didn't, he never gave up. He had the third piece of land because that was after the revolution. It was very easy, not easy, but it was granted a permit for the church. And the, the President Sisi, when he came, I think he was nicer than, than the previous ones in Mubarak. He, he gave, I think, about 30 permits for churches in one time, and his church was one of them. So uh, he built a church with, you know, with a lot of effort, a lot of security, but it was successfully open. And at the day of opening, there was so much administration and so much rioting outside trying to shut it down again. So ever since then, I know he was a target for so long because eventually he succeeded to put a church in a place that it was completely rejected and it was just resisted completely. So uh, I know he was a target. I am not personally surprised of what happened. I expected that throughout the whole past 20 years. Perhaps most of my families are surprised because he kept that away from them. And I know even his own wife, she will tell you that there was no threat on his life ever because he kept her away from that. They want her to be terrified every day. He goes out, he may not come back. So imagine that thought and the feeling. But that's how I felt. And I know one day I will hear something terrible happen to him. And unfortunately, the day has come. I am so sorry to hear this, especially when you lose your brother um yeah. in this occasion it's twins like when losing the family members um not like they died from heart attack or car accident or yeah. any accident but intentionally someone tried to took his life um in that young age that's just it is i can i can assume it is very difficult uh thing to process um yeah. just um, kind of for me to understand a little bit deeper. Um, so you grew up in a Christian family and God has been gracious to you. Your father and your mother were um, from early age involved discipling children. Therefore, by default, they disciple their own children and uh, brought them up as uh, people who are falling in love with our trying God. Um, so what kind of gentleman was your brother? He was very, very loving person. He loves everybody, young and old and widows and everybody. He, he just he was like a father for so many that even we don't know about him. There's a lot of people came in his funeral, even will say he was like a father to us. He was a member of our family. Many, many, many families came out and said the same thing. He was a great help to all of them. He was a spiritual leader, a spiritual father, and also physical father to, to all of them in, in, in a sense of taking care of their need and trying to help them out as much as he can. And they all loved him. It was just, yeah. I, mean, I don't know if you've seen the funeral, you know, there is- I, wa I was which, told, I was told that he was very humble. Yeah, he was, he was down to earth, very humble. So um, in 1996, he become yeah. priest in Orthodox church. Um, I don't have that much knowledge on uh, persecuted Christians in Egypt, but I am well, very much aware that one out of eight Christians worldwide is being heavily persecuted. Egypt is a country uh, kind of according to Open Doors, I think it's ranked 20. Uh, 20th dangerous country for people to be Christian, and there is a heavy persecution in Egypt. And yeah. you and your family grew up in Egypt. Uh, did you, like, what was expectation um, of your brother when he become priest? Um, didn't you kind of think that will be more dangerous? He will be more of his ta target for uh, Muslims who don't want him to be in the land because apparently Muslims claim Egypt is Muslim country. Yes. Well, Christian in Egypt, 
a sort of secondhand, what do you call it, the second second class citizen. Let's put it this way. So mm -hmm. they don't have. There's so many. So so many rights doesn't apply to them. Yeah. The specific the education, specific places. Of course, there was always discrimination in hiring people, especially in the government or especially in the high ranking uh, positions. Christians are very much excluded from all these things. And also, when you when you deal uh, when you when you're in, a, in your neighborhood. I mean, people look down on you as like, you're not one of us, you know, you're just, you're an infidel, you know, you're, you're going to hell, you know, it's just like, but there's a lot of nice, nice Muslim people around us too, so it's not all of them, but imagine when you hear the, 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 the Friday preaching every week in your own window, you know, at the house, cursing you and wishing all the horrible things on you and on your family and your kids and your parents and you and, and the Jews. It's just, I don't know, I guess we get used to it. We just hear it all the time. You get used to it and you just don't pay attention to it. But everywhere you go on Friday, you hear it. And at the same time, there is so much uh, persecution, actually, let's say killing that it took place especially during the time of Sadat, President Sadat and Mubarak, which is the two previous ones to the, to the current one. Because President Sadat, you know, I don't know if you know him first, I mean, if you heard about him or not. Yeah, he was in the, in the 70s, from 1970 to I think 80, 81 or something like that. He was assassinated anyway. But President Sadat was one of the, one member of the Muslim Brotherhood himself. So the previous president, there was an assassination attempt on his life from the Muslim Brotherhood and he survived. So he put them all away. But when he was, when he died, then President Sadat, who was, he was his vice president, he took over and he released all of them. He was one of them. He released all of them. And he emboldened them because there was so much violence and so much horrific things that took place. And he just did nothing, technically. He actually, he just took it as a, as a, as a reason to continue persecuting church, I mean, a, a Christian, as if they were the instigator of all that. So he made up so much lies and... Just, so he didn't, was, he didn't only turn blind eye what was happening, but he also joined in and encouraged uh, he more, joined in. He more joined in. He and did. persecutions to take place. Yes, I mean, I think I remember one day he was here in the United States visiting and then some Christian here, they protested against him and he made them look bad. He went back immediately to Egypt and did the, and they said a, a big long speech, hateful speech against this old Christian and, and, and the, you know, the, the Archbishop, the Pope, and the, all, all the leadership of the church. And then he arrested hundreds of them and put them in prison. And the, even the Pope, he eliminated his, uh, his residency in one of the monasteries and he's trying to replace him with somebody else. It was just massive persecution. So, Fortunately, it didn't last long because he was assassinated within a few months after that. Um, and then, okay. And then Kim Mubarak after him pretty much turned a blind eye to the same thing. Yeah. It, yeah. It kind of, you don't know how to deal with the teachings of Islam. What, what is the next best thing to do is turn blind eye or exactly. doing what is already happening. Yeah. Uh, so, you are talking about huge persecution in Egypt before mm -hmm. Father yeah. Arsenius become a, a priest. So, yes, am I right? To, yeah, am I right to understand that he knew it would be dangerous to become a priest? Yeah, um, you know, he, he, to be a dangerous, uh, dangerous job. Let's put it this way, but. Here's, here's the thing. There's so many priests over there. Very few were assassinated or very few were killed. Not everybody, not all of them. But those who are very active become targets. So when you say active, I will just want to yeah. kind of make sure we understood that term correct. So um, in Egypt, you can't do evangelism. So being active yeah, right. means it's simply 
engaging with people who are already Christian and yes. teaching, this, uh, teaching the scripture, discipling them. Yes. Yeah. But okay. that's one thing. But once you start to go outside the black, for example, it's not just about evangelizing to Muslim or not. It's about expanding the church, your own yeah. church, building another church, you know, ministry, like, like ex expanding your congregation and, and building other building to help the, the ministry and all the stuff that consider being so active. Yeah. Because if you just happen to be just a peaceful priest in your own church, to your own people, you, you could be okay, but once you start to be very active, you're a target. You already that, that, my brother was very, very active in that. Yeah, because you already expressed that he wanted to build a church in an area oh, yeah. there were lots of Christians, but there was no church. Um and funny at that time, I don't know if you heard that before. At that time, there was no permit given ever to to, to build a new church since since so that came over there was no such a thing yeah. and even the the plan was this like i don't know if you heard about the, the, the revolution in egypt came in 1952 the, the first president who came with president nasser he issued a law nobody fix anything in a church unless it even comes directly with a permission from the president of the of the country so even if you want to fix a faucet or, or a toilet you have to get permission from them so no new building. So his idea was, we'll give them a hundred years. All these old churches that exist at that time, eventually is gonna fall apart. They will never be able to fix it because we have to give them the permission to fix it. So within a hundred years, there'll be no more churches in Egypt. That was the plan. Imagine that. So there was no permit given ever to a church during Nasser's time or Sadat time. Yeah. Um, that actually comes from um, Islamic traditions, but that's, oh, yes. yeah. yeah. So we know where it came from. Father Arsenius is kind, generous, uh, loving priest who tries yeah. to build a church in an area. There are lots of Christians, yet there is no church. Yes. And um, does a couple of attempts to buy the land, and that even in, I think you said 2003 a guard is being thrown from the building and he got killed. Yeah. Um, there mm -hmm. were lots of attempts to kind of stop him building the church. When he yeah. got the permission, he built the church in the intention yeah. of discipling believers. In with all that difficulties, kind of he's able to extend the church. He's able to uh, meet yeah. with the believers, uh, pray together, worship together, study the scripture, handle the word of God and love yeah. one another and encourage one another to fall in love more and more with triune God. Yeah. Um, do you know uh, kind of days towards 7th of April or do you know the details of what happened on the day when he was killed? Yes, I know the details exactly. It didn't take long. As a matter of fact, I don't know in... in this was, of course, you know, the, the, the month of Ramadan, right? So in Egypt, the month of Ramadan, especially when it comes in the, in the summer or a hot weather time, the beach is for, for Christian, okay? Muslims don't go to the beach at that time. So the beach is empty, it's just for us. So we go there, we do retreat, we do worship, we do everything we want, it's just, it's just for us. So he had a group of, I think with the, 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 the group of girls from high schoolers, like youth group. He was he took him out, you know, to the beach. There were like I think three minivans were loaded. They went there, spend the day, you know, preaching and worship and on the beach. And when it was time to leave, probably around sunset, close to sunset, which was supposed to be the time of breaking the fast of Ramadan. So the the drivers of the minivan they just pulled over and the, the the young ladies they started to you know just just got into the van and he was the last one to get into the van he wanted to make sure everybody's in before uh, before he gets in the van and all of a sudden there was somebody those two people sitting there close to them right on you know, one of them looks looks like a beggar and there was another guy with him. So the bigger came walking to my brother, 
trying to distract him as if he's begging for something. And all of a sudden, the other guy came from behind him and he stabbed him in the neck right in here. Slash this, the first shot, three times. Although my brother did not fall down on the ground, like a lot of people say, he stood up and he stayed, he just held his hand and he didn't say nothing. But So they rushed him into the van and uh, the driver tried to help him, you know, trying to do something about it. And then the, the attacker tried, started to attack the driver. But eventually that the driver was able to hold him down and overtake him and held him until the police came. So he was arrested on the spot. He couldn't escape. And then one of the van took my brother straight to the hospital, which I think he was already dead when we went to, to the hospital. They're just trying to do something or trying to say that we're trying, but he was, he was already gone. I'm sorry that I had to uh, cause you to kind of uh, rewind back and uh, go through the uh, same story. I am sorry. And um, That's I'm guessing that is like kind of painful to remember with the details. So um, he's taking uh, young adults or youth to a beach with yeah. full, full of three minivan. And yeah. as they spend their day by worshiping, praying, reflection, um, on their way, they are kind of finished their time. They are getting into van and about to leave. Mm -hmm. A man comes and then one man is distracts, um, distracts um, Father Arsenas. And then another man behind comes with a knife and tries to cut his neck. Yes. Um, I was told that actually the person who um, killed him was was just passing by, just didn't like the um, dress uh, priest was wearing. Therefore, it happened. Also, um, the kind of this pass passerby person who killed who killed the priest uh, had the mental health issues. Um, have you got any comments on that? Yeah, that was the very first thing that was always circulated in the media right away. That was a crazy man, it was an insane man, something, without even anybody examining him right away before anything happened. But, but the, the, they're just trying to get Islam out of it, technically. So that's, that's where the whole issue started. And then, of course, they said, oh, he was just passing by. All kind of made up stories. But th those two guys that were sitting there for a while, and, and so many people saw them sitting there for a while. So it wasn't like just passing by, like they say. You're going to hear a lot of made up stories just to try to, uh, I would say, uh, take Islam out of it or Muslims out of it. All it's just, it has nothing to do with Muslims, it has nothing to do with Islam. It's just a, a coincidence. This is, by the way, this is a pattern of, of, of news media that always do the same thing. And I don't remember since maybe the last 30 years or so that all this violence incident, all the horrific things that happened to Christians, I don't remember one person got convicted. So there's always somebody sick, somebody's mentally ill, somebody was just didn't mean to, there was no, it's just all kind of excuse because a Muslim blood could never be given in return of, a, of, a, yeah. of an infidel blood. Okay, that's just the way it is. Yeah. And we, it, we, seems, we will. it seems that it has been pretty motivated because person is waiting there and oh, yes. as a knife and it's not like by accident he just like knife no, gets no. the neck but three times in the intention I mean look at the timing look at the timing of it I mean this guy supposedly a Muslim guy by the way they now started the news that came out that he was a member of the a leader of the, the Muslim Brotherhood, by the way. So the news just started to trickle down. Okay. He was a leader of the Muslim Brotherhood. Yes. But like but I the, said, look at the time now. So, sorry, the, it, um, yeah. the guy who killed. Yes. 
your brother is the member or leader of the, the Muslim the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood. Absolutely, it, is, it started to come up. The news started. I mean, not the news, but it's, it's the investigation. People started to investigate yeah. themselves, and they, they know him. They found out that, and he has a whole history of criminal activities. So that's just started started to trickle down. But look at the timing of the day. You know, this this is the time that the guy supposedly sitting home eating or breaking his fast not sitting on the beach waiting for somebody yeah it just doesn't make sense whatever comes out it just doesn't make sense but the timing and uh, i think it was you know it was planned for a while and he was watched he was probably followed and it was just perfect timing by the time he's been taking the hospital um he was already announced as dead that's no, it was not announced. They announced him dead after yeah. maybe 45 minutes or so yeah. to try and survive him. But I, I don't know, they're just trying to pretend that they were doing something, but I think he was dead. I mean, the, the amount of blood that, that just came out of his, you know, his body before he made it to a hospital, it was just hopeless. Did you hear about this through news or through uh, family friends? How did you hear about it? No, I heard about it from my sister. Yeah, my okay. sister called me right away. And my sister, actually, she was the one, she went straight to the hospital. It's really interesting that the hospital was across the street from her house. So she was there before anybody got there. Yeah. And she was there. Yeah. Most of our families are here, by the way. So she's the only one who was there as yeah. a sister, you know. I heard it from her and I heard it from my other sisters and you know and, and her husband. It's, it's not it's not from the media. Okay. Beside the media, you know, beside what it was said in the media, but yeah, I heard it directly from my sister. Yeah. And um how are they doing? How are they coping? It's it's tougher for them, much, much harder on them, especially from them being there and being in a funeral and watching all this stuff. It's just it's harder on them on us, you know. So um, he got killed on Thursday, the 7th of April, and the uh, yes. funeral was following day? The very next day, yes. It was technically at 3 o'clock Egypt time, at 2 o'clock Egypt time, which was, he was very much uh, killed at 8 o'clock in the evening, and 2 o'clock the next day, the funeral was on. They don't wait, yeah, they don't wait there. They were just, that's just a, cultural things so they, yeah. they don't wake people and your your sisters were able to go to funeral but you weren't able to go yeah none of us i have three sisters two sisters need a brother none of us were able to make it which is that's uh, the, that's the price we will pay for a living here <laughs> my, my, we, we missed both of our parents funeral too the same way so um how is how is his church is coping it's very difficult. It's very, their, 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 their congregation loved him to death. Uh, he was their, 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 their father, technically. But it's just hard for them to imagine that he was gone like that. And there's so much anger. There's so much hurt. There's so much bitterness on some people. But I know it's, it's, it's very difficult, very difficult on this congregation. Um, so he's your brother, yes. a priest uh, who is identified very loving, very kind, generous, and humble. Uh, at age 60, yes. uh, brutally killed uh, in, the, in the seaside. What do you think about the murderer who is identified as the now leader of the Muslim Brotherhood? Uh, what are your thoughts about him? Um, what are your feelings about him? Told, um, technically, like, like, like I said, he was mentally ill, mentally sick. You know, that's mostly what they said. And that's not the first time they said about a killer before. And what happened is most time they just uh, the elder is just mentally ill. We put him in a in a asylum or mentally it was a, a hospital for sick people, and they just sit there. 
and then the, the story dies down or the new story comes out and the old one dies down and nobody knows who that person is and it's over so i think that's probably the plan but i don't know how far is it, they're gonna go with this what is your personal thoughts um on him do you have did you pray for god to take revenge or uh you pray that him to turn to lord jesus christ before he dies well that's what makes christianity different than islam we don't take revenge ourselves we leave the revenge to the lord and he he promised and he said vengeance is mine i repay says the lord we don't take revenge ourselves and i was just reading roman 12 you know it's just just the whole the, the end of that last the, the, the last paragraph and then the whole uh, chapter i said if you if your enemy is hungry feed him if he's thirsty give him drink but in doing this you will heave a call of, of fire of, of a of call, call of fire on his head do not overcome by evil by over but overcome evil with good our revenge is from the lord and it's just every everywhere you you, you, you read you just just read the, the, the whole sermon and the mount you'll see how much our lord told us to forgive and forgive and love your enemy and just leave it to the lord he will take revenge we don't we don't revenge it's, it's very interesting the very first thing uh, my brother's wife said in the first interview she said we forgive you and we pray that the lord will open your eyes to see the truth and to know what you have done was from satan this is not this is not a god who who condone this stuff but also we pray for you that your god your eye will be open and so, to know jesus christ so your sister-in-law his yes. wife soon yes. after his death expressed yes. that she has forgiven yes the Hila who brutally uh, yes killed a priest um and we pray and, that she pray that he will he will find christ yeah like yes. not only forgiving and then but also saying like I pray that one day you will turn to Lord Jesus Christ. What is yes. it? You express that there is uniqueness in Christian faith that allows people to forgive. Um, would you be kind enough to kind of unpack that little bit for me? Because it we live in a society, we live in a world where we were told, well, if someone takes your things, you go and take their things. If someone hurts you, you hurt them back. You take the revenge. But what is it? in the hearts of Christians uh, that enables us as a Christian to simply forgive even someone who killed my husband, someone who killed my brother. Well, if we look at what Christ did for us, that will just give us the answer because we all owe so much debt to the Lord. And he himself came and paid for it himself, and he forgave us all. And he said, if you don't forgive your brother, you, you, your sins are not going to be forgiven. So we forgive because we are forgiven much. If we, if we look at how much Jesus forgave us, we were, we were condemned to death. And he gave us life by forgiving us. So we should forgive others. That's the message. And, and, and that's what makes Christianity unique among any other religion that it very much uh, say, you know, take revenge, you know, get back at them. You know, somebody hurt you, you hurt them back. But Jesus said, you love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you. And if your enemy is hungry, you feed him. And if he's thirsty, you give him, give him a drink. And that's, that's what makes Christianity unique. And that's what makes Christianity is the religion of love and forgiveness because we, so have, we, don't a, take we have a god who forgives us we have a god who allows us to turn to him um so you talked about how in the past 
Christians are being persecuted. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it was a couple of years ago, uh, 21 Christians were killed. I remember like that was a couple of years ago. And yes. uh, in 2017 on Palm Sunday, time of Easter again, 28 Christians were killed. It's just very, very much, very much common. And now yeah. you lost part of you. You lost your loved one. You lost your brother. Uh, do you do you take that as okay? Now we need to be silent and like limit ourselves. Don't practice our religion or don't practice what we believe, uh, or even like stop this. Like I would, I was gonna ask stop evangelizing but in Egypt we can't do that um, stop discipling stop feeding the church what is your kind of overall intake for the church from this well when you expect to pay a price for your faith you just keep going because if, if you calculate see people calculate the cost before they decide to follow Jesus once you calculate the cost and you know it's going to cost you and then you decided to pay it. There is no returning. There is no turning back. So we are not going to stop evangelizing. We're not going to stop doing what our Lord Jesus told us to do. Just because so much threats. And look at the disciple. That's the, that's the greatest example. Do you think that uh, Paul took, took a permission from the Roman to preach the gospel? No. The Paul, uh, the, the Peter took permission from the Jews, from the leaders of the Jews in Jerusalem to preach. No, he just went out and preached, knowing that he's going to pay a price and knowing that they're all going to pay a price. So this is the, the early church is the greatest example to follow. There was no, there is nobody to to fear. You know, we're going to obey God more than men. We're going to preach the gospel no matter what what the cost is, and. We believe, and it's been proven throughout the whole history, especially in, in, in our days, we say, that the more persecution, the faster the church grows. And we can see that in all over the Middle East and all over the country, it has so much persecution. For example, like uh, China and Iran, can you believe Iran, are the fastest growing church in the world. There is so many Christians now in, 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 in Iran that nobody knows. In all in secret, there is no churches, but there is millions of them coming to Christ because of severe persecution. China, China has over, it's all estimated, over 150 million now are Christian in spite of all this severe persecution. So we always say that the seed, that the blood of the martyr is the seed of the church. And God does not waste a, blood, a drop of blood from a martyr, but to bring people to salvation. <clears throat> And this is evidence everywhere you turn. There is millions of people leaving Islam now in the Middle East. Whether they come to Christ or become atheists, there is millions of people leaving. And it's very, it's very obvious. I mean, I'm, I'm on Facebook all the time. You see that millions of them. It's very interesting that I watched that. It was last year. Yeah, last year was an ad. It was put by a Saudi... I don't know what they call it, ministry or Saudi Dawah ministry, trying to, to raise money for Indonesia. And in, in, the, in their own words, they said there's 2 million people leaving Islam in Indonesia every year. We have to stop that. We don't have the resource. Give us the money. We're going to do it. And they started to go and to, to, to explain how evangelism in Indonesia is bringing millions of people to Christ every day. That's just, that's with their own confession. So people are leaving Islam because, you know, it's very interesting that I always picture Islam versus Christianity, especially in a country that have Christians. There's a lot of Muslim countries that have very few Christians, so they probably do not really know much about Christianity. But imagine when you go to a, to a jewelry store and you're trying to buy a nice, expensive, you know, beautiful, shiny piece of diamond. You see it as always, the piece of diamond is always put on a 
piece of a black velvet, right? Or even yeah. you know, if you buy it in a small box, it's a black velvet box, and they put the piece of diamond in it. What that what that, what does it do is it makes the piece of diamond shine more in a black background versus if you put it on a, on a white background. That's the same thing in Islam. Islam is a very dark religion. And because there's a few Christian among them, they shine, immediately they shine. And at the same time, the piece of cloth, they actually see that it's much more darker than it is because the piece of diamond reveals it. So that's Christianity in the Middle East in general. It's just a, 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 a piece of diamond that it shines on a piece of black velvet. That's just how I see it. And, and Christianity always, always exposed Islam by the, the teaching of Christianity, the forgiveness of Christianity, always exposed, just like white and black. It, it's exposed, yeah. the, the light exposed the darkness immediately. Yeah, like yeah. Islam, Islam is very dark ideology. Yeah. Um, and in somehow these beautiful people who are made in the image of God, is being uh, kind of covered with that darkness. And yes. Lord Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, comes to shine into that darkness so that darkness yes. can get rid of, um, we can get rid of darkness. Yeah. His light is so powerful, will crush the darkness. Uh, I guess what I'm kind of taking from your response to my question is, uh, Persecution will continue. Uh, oh, yes. What you are seeing is still uh, through persecution, we get to see churches growing. Through persecution, yes. we get to see people are repenting and turning to Lord Jesus Christ. I guess yes. one of the kind of reason for that is, for example, you expressed how your sister-in-law was able to simply say, I have forgiven the man who killed my husband. That message of forgiveness goes out, touches the hearts and minds of people, and then simply ask the question, how can this woman can forgive someone who killed her husband? Not in a character, but intentionally just trying to chop his neck off. It's Christ in her. That's Christ in her who makes her do that. Yeah, yeah. Power of our glorious God. Yes. Uh, like we talk about how our gospel is glorious. It's because Absolutely. our God is glorious. Our God is glorious, yeah. therefore our gospel is glorious. The message and, is glorious. Yeah. Like people can persecute us, people can uh, kill our loved ones, even people can kill us. As a Christian, we do acknowledge that our triune God doesn't need us in this world. It is just a privilege for us that our triune God is willing to use us in this world. When time comes, when he takes us home, we are ready to go. But yes. when priests are being killed, just any Christian is being killed, any child of God is being killed, that doesn't stop the gospel. Gospel is going no, to reach in the house of yes. every Muslim. Gospel yes. is going to reach in house of yes. every atheist, every Buddhist, all other religion. That yes. won't, like gospel is going to get into Mecca. Gospel yes. is oh. get, going to get into the mosques in Egypt. Yes. Gospel yes. is going to get into the hearts and minds of those young Muslim children, imams, sheikhs, scholars yes bible makes it very clear one day every knee is going to every bow down to lord it. jesus christ willingly yes. or unwillingly it's going to happen and when yes. we when your sister-in-law speaks out for um power of forgiveness she's just saying now this is opportunity for you to repent and turn to Lord Jesus Christ willingly. Yeah. Because yes. when it happens unwillingly, when people confess Christ is the Lord unwillingly, 
that is going to be very long and painful punishment. Yeah. And in that yeah. stage, it is too late. So therefore, It'll be too late. Yeah, therefore, as a Christian, while we know God doesn't need us, but we do acknowledge that the world is desperately in need of our glorious gospel and our glorious yes. God. Yes, that's why we need to evangelize no matter what. Time is short. The Lord's yeah. return is very soon and, and people are dying every day. So that's why evangelism has to be, it's an urgent thing. Because whoever is alive today cannot guarantee to live tomorrow. So there's so many people that you, and there could be around all of us, and you just wonder, oh, well, maybe I'll talk to them tomorrow, maybe next month, maybe when the time, you know, is right. And then all of a sudden they're gone. It's, a, it's, it's, eternal, it's, a, it's eternal life, whether with Jesus or, or in, the, in the lake of fire. So we know that it's like somebody's house is on fire. And we know that people inside there are dying. And we just sit there and watch. No, we can't do that. We have to go there and rescue. And uh, the message of the gospel is offensive. There's so many people may not accept it. That's okay. It's not our job for people to accept it. But it's our job for us to, to, to plant the seed. We're not responsible for the harvest. But we are responsible to plant the seed. And uh, people are dying every day. Evangelism is urgent. Everybody, I mean, if you love the person, you tell them about it. It doesn't matter if you like it or not. It's something I do expect, but I am still shocked that uh, it's been only a couple of days your brother is being killed. You are, as a Christian, you are going through that grievement process. Mm -hmm. And in that, you are telling me I need to evangelize. We need to preach our glorious gospel to the world because those things happen because people don't know the gospel. People Thank are dying every day and they will have, they will die here and they will die eternally. Thank you for reminding that. It, even like in these difficult days, because your focus could be something else but your focus is we need to continue evangelizing. Yeah. Thank, yeah. thank you thank you for that reminder, brother. It's uh, just interesting that the same thing that I remember, I mean, just when this thing happened, I just remember my father, Zachary Botros, you know, we were sitting with him, you know, several years ago in a conference and, and he was just telling us his story was uh, how his, his brother was killed. It's the same thing, you know, just the reason, right after his brother was killed, he started to look into Islam. How does that happen? Why did they, they kill my brother? Why? And then he started to learn more and more about Islam and God used them. Look how many millions of people come to Christ through his ministry. Yeah. Right after the killing of his brother. So it's just, uh, it's just constant reminder. Our Lord uses everything for yes. his glory, everything for his glory. Um, yes. Beloved of Christ, have you got any last thoughts or anything you would like to mention? It's very interesting that I feel like God was preparing us for this moment. But me and my wife, we, uh, we are involved in, in so many ministries, but one of them was the ministry of the Voice of the Martyr. I'm not sure if most of you heard of it or not. The Voice of the Martyr is a ministry that brings awareness to the Christian in the free country here in the United States or, or Europe or Australia or wherever it's a free Christian. Brings awareness of the persecuted church so that we will be one body in Christ to pray for each other and pray for the persecuted church and tell their stories, which is a lot of them, actually all of them are inspiring story to our faith, you know, those who are living in a free country that we're not dealing with persecution. And we used to go speak in churches and you know, tell the stories of the persecuted church everywhere. And we are aware of where it's persecution all over the world and how God is using persecution to uh, to grow his church in those specifically in those difficult places like, like i mentioned before and god prepare us for this moment by 
make us aware of persecution everywhere. And it's been estimated, I think there's, uh, the number now is bigger. It's, it used to be 600 million Christian are living under persecution in our, in our time. It's very interesting when we started this, we used to work with the ministry in the very beginning, it's like 12 years ago, the number was probably 200 million. Now it was about 600 million. Imagine that just in the last 10 years. But one big reason of that number jumped very high because there's a lot more Christian, a lot more people came to Christ in those persecuted church from those who were persecuting the Christian. Imagine the number becomes bigger by, by those who were persecuting the Christian. They become Christian and they're also now being persecuted. So it's very interesting. The number is big, but it shows the glory of God in expanding his church in the middle of persecution. So I feel that God prepared our hearts for that. And when it happened, it's sort of expected. It's, 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 it's sad and it's hard to take, but it is, uh, it is part of uh, our world. And just because it happened to others that it may not happen to us, yes, it does. It could happen to you, to, to your family, which should hit hard in our family but it hit hard in other families too. When I look at the other people, especially in Nigeria, I don't know if you've seen a horrific picture come out yeah. of Nigeria almost every that. day. Yeah, there almost is every day. Is going on over there. And nobody hears about it. Nobody hears about it. And the world is not talking about it, but it's just, it's a daily thing. It just breaks your heart and you just feel like, well, this is the world. This is the world we're living in until Jesus comes. This is how it's going to be. And we should accept it. We should be okay with it, because it was. It's very interesting that it was promised. It was promised in the Bible, so I don't. I don't. We shouldn't be surprised. Yeah, like Jesus tells us, in this world you will have trouble, but mm -hmm. I have overcome it. And the world. yeah, Scripture talks about uh, how, as a Christian, we should, because of we are Christian, we should. Ex expect, ex expect persecution. Uh, and Paul said, those who desire to live in godliness will suffer persecution. So it's yeah. like, you're gonna follow the Lord, you will be persecuted. So that's just, it's a given, it's a given. So when it comes, we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be like, why, why, why? It is it is a promise, and uh, but the reward is great, so that's, we should always look up there to the reward. Where we're going to be? What is the reward? It's Jesus Christ Himself. He is our reward. It's not yeah. about going to yeah, and not going things, but to. God Himself. He is our reward. Yeah. He is our reward. Yes. And yeah. if He's not going to be in heaven, we don't want that to happen. Yeah, twenty twenty two, and one out of eight Christian, like one out of eight Christians, are being heavily persecuted persecuted yes 21st century heavy persecution against the children of god mm -hmm. there is a heavy persecution against sons of god and yes we he read in the story of paul when paul is persecuting the christians jesus says yeah. Why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? Yeah. Yes. It's a it's a personal personal attack on our Lord. Yeah. And of course, you express this is the broken world. It's not we are living yeah. in last days. We are living in biblical times. And yes. Solution to this broken world is. Christ, Christ alone, no, no one else, nothing else, Christ alone. And as with, with Christ alone, we will get to see every human being is having peace with one another because they yeah. have peace with God. If you do yeah. not have peace with God, you will never able to have peace with one another. Therefore, right. if you become very normal when you walk on the street, you will try to yeah. kill someone. You will sit by the sea and then wait a Christian priest to walk so that you can take his life. Why? Because you do not have peace with God. Therefore, you do not have peace 
with one another. Heart needs to be changed, heart needs to be transformed, and that only can be done by Christ alone. There is no one else able to fix our hearts. There is no one else able to fix our hearts or our minds. It's only Lord Jesus Christ who can. Yes. Um, it reveals the difference between the gods. Like it's very interesting when you see if you God tell you to love and the other God tell you to kill, definitely that's not the same God. Yeah. And I mean, just like, I mean, I always talk about comparison. Compared to the followers of a God to each other, then you will you will be able to compare the gods to each other. Like look at the follower of, of, of Islam, let's say after Muhammad died, look at his his friends, what did they do? They went out killing each other and killing everybody and robbing and stealing and killing. And they killed each other, a lot of them, including Aisha, they killed her. That's 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 the God that they followed. Look at the disciple. They went out to the whole world preaching the gospel of love and truth, and they died for it. They gave the life for it. It tells you about who you follow. Yeah. You follow you follow like a mafia guy telling you, you know, go kill and rob and give me the fifth. And that is that is, is that is that a holy God? No. Versus the God who tell you to go love the world, preach the gospel, tell them the truth, and if it's cost to your life, give it. That's a big difference. It all goes back to what kind of God you follow. Exactly, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And, and your, your fruit, it, that's the fruit, the fruit of Islam. It's clear and it, it's, it's rotten fruit, and this is the, the, the fruit of it. And the fruit of Christianity, it's, it's pure and it's it's clear to everybody. And it's like like the, the piece of diamond. Very interested. The, the piece of diamond when you put it on a on a, on a black velvet cloth, it shines more. That's how it is. Christian in persecution, they shine brighter. Just like when you see a dark, I mean, in in a very dark sky with no lights, and you see the stars are brighter in a much darker, much darker sky. That's how it is in, 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 in Islam. Unfortunately, we, we're living in a dark world and dark Islamic world, but we shine. We shine brighter the darker it is. The, the darker it gets, the more we shine. And everybody should have that in their mind. There will be persecution. There will be darkness. Shine. You need to shine. Jesus put us here to shine and to reflect his light. We're not here to be our own light, or we, we don't have a light in our own. We should reflect his. And at the same time, we should not just sit there and, and look at the dark place and, and wonder and, and, and just freeze. But we should shine. This coming Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Yeah. And it just makes me to think no one can stop Christ. Grave no couldn't hold Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, the world we live won't be able to stop our glorious gospel to get into the hearts and minds of individuals. No yes. one is able to stop that. Remember, yeah. that tomb is empty. Grave empty. couldn't hold Lord Jesus okay. Christ. Your yes. lives won't be able to stop our glorious gospel. Your stones won't able to stop our glorious gospel. Persecution won't able to stop our glorious gospel. It is going to make our glorious gospel to become more glorious because our God is just a glorious God. Glorious God, yes. And his message is glorious. Yeah. Um, any last thoughts, brother? I just wanted to thank all those who prayed for us and those who were send condolence to us. I'm not sure if anybody knows us from your view, but I'm sure there's people on Facebook with me that I don't know them, but they, but I appreciate everybody who prayed and they continue to pray for us. And I just wanted to pray for God to be glorified in this. You know, it's not, it's not a personal issue anymore. It's about the glory of the Lord to be shown in the midst of this, because just like I was, I was always mesmerized by the example of the diamond on the black velvet, 
just give the glory to God because he is going to use this event to open door, to speak about him, to talk about him, to talk about his message of love. And uh, the darkness will be revealed to those who are living in darkness and they will desire the light. You know, it's pretty interesting. I always remember one thing I always say, when you shine a light, a flashlight, it's, when you go like in a dark place or dark cave and you shine a, you know, a powerful flashlight in it, yeah. first of all, you will see the cockroach will run, run away from the light. But the moth will come to be attracted to the light. They will come flying toward the light. They love it. But the snakes will attack you. So this is the gospel message. You will give the gospel message. The cockroach will always run away from it. Those who love the light will come to it and will be attracted to the message and will love it and will take it. But there will be always those who wants to hurt you. The snakes. So that's the gospel message in, in a nutshell. Just pray for, for us that God will uh, comfort our heart and uh, just uh, to use this for his glory. I mean, I'm, I'm really concerned about how God, God can be glorified in all this. Uh, beloved of Christ, please, please do forgive me if I ask a question which was, uh, Improper or not sensitive, please, please do forgive me. It wasn't my intention to cause any pain oh, or anything. Um, please do forgive me. It's all good. It's all. Uh, it's an honor and a blessing to be with you. And God bless, um, you. God bless you. Thank you, brother. Hear the calling of not only forgiveness but urgency of preaching our glorious gospel. Um. One, or one out of eight Christians are being persecuted heavily because of their faith in Christ. Lord Jesus Christ is worthy and none can stop him. None can stop him. Brother, thank you very much for sharing your heart with me. But above all, thank you so much for showing us once again as a Christian, we do not grieve like the world. As a Christian, our grievement is different because we know we have hope and our hope is in Christ alone. Thank you so much, brother.